Hello and welcome to the second of our special editions of the Sky News Daily podcast with me, Dermot Murnahan. Now, uh, a dozen of our correspondents are joining me over three episodes in total to reflect on some of the, the big, the momentous stories of 2021. So over the next half an hour in this podcast, we'll be discussing themes surrounding global security, the migrant crisis and politics. And as ever to discuss it all, I have a panel of Sky News's very best and biggest experts, our political editor, Beth Rigby, Dominic Waghorn, our international affairs editor, along with Sky correspondent, Ashna Hurinag. Uh, joining us remotely, our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, and Europe correspondent, Adam Parsons, welcome to you all. Well, what a lot we've got to discuss. Up first, uh, let's take you through some of the biggest global stories of the year. I will be a president for all Americans. Multiple capital entries and objects. 1649 hours declaring it a right. I think it's a procession of, of the Taliban. Yes, it is. There's the white flag. These 20 years have felt like both a long time and a short time. This house has lost a steadfast servant. The title of the report is China's elite capture. I think Russia itself is, is moving from being an authoritarian state to being a much more totalitarian state. A flavour, just a flavour of what's been going on in this momentous year. Well, Dominic, we should, of course, start with you. And there's a kind of thread running through the Biden presidency. This time a year ago, as we heard there, he was president-elect, well, in most people's minds, uh, not in the in the sitting presidents, of course. Uh, and even before he, he came to power, there was the extraordinary event in the heart of Washington itself, in the heart of global democracy. Yeah, the event that that photograph behind you is, is, uh, is showing, uh, the assault on the Capitol. And I think we kind of forget, in a way, the year began with that. It seems to almost belong to a different time after a year of Biden in, in the White House. But it, it is a crucial event. And I think when foreign policy students come to study 2021 in, in, the, in the coming years, there are two key events. Obviously, the Afghanistan debacle, but also of equal importance is the assault on the Capitol. Because this was America... Turning it against itself, a sizable number of Americans um, desecrating the Holy of Holies in Washington, the high temple of, of their democracy, goaded on by their own president, who was peddling this grand lie that the election had been uh, stolen, um, and uh, being helped and facilitated by social media. And, and the, the message to the world was that this was a, an America that was divided, riddled with self-doubt, and that is important in terms of our global security because it has, I think, uh, undermined the support or the, the confidence of allies in America, um, even though we have a new president. And, and the challenge for Joe Biden was to deal with that and also to see off enemies and rivals who've been emboldened, not just by the Trump presidency, but the CODA, the spectacular CODA that, that ended it. And, and his promise, Biden, was to, the, to bring back America. Uh, America is back, he said taking its rightful place in, in his mind as leader of the free world and um, enforcing the Pax Americana. After the four years he would regard as an aberration, America is back. Alex, uh, talk to us about, as uh, Dominic called it, and he wouldn't have been the first, the, the debacle of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and, of course, Britain intimately involved. Well, what a shameful episode of history, actually, international history, that whole... Um, period was. Still now, I'm getting emails and phone calls from people that we interviewed, uh, doctors, health workers in the hospitals, uh, female rights activists, who showed me pictures of them side by side with Laura Bush, <laughs> the former first lady, working with the British military, arm in arm with British soldiers, American soldiers, uh, all sorts of international workers who now won't pick up the phone to them and won't, won't help them. And they're still ringing me and texting my producer and my team saying, please help us out, please get us out. I'm a journalist like you. Can you somehow get us out? The Taliban are knocking on our door. The Taliban's beaten my brother. The Taliban's killed my aunt. Please come and help us. So it's very difficult to have been involved in that story, very difficult to have um, stood in, in Afghanistan or in Kabul and talked to these people and say, you know those 20 years that you spent working side by side where you thought the future was different, the future was going to be bright and the, your international partners were going to stand side by side with you? It's very difficult to look them in the eye right now and say, yeah, they kept all their promises because they very definitely didn't. And Beth Rigby, I mean, from the... Um... From the British perspective, we're talking there about uh, its involvement in the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And in reality, if the Americans were going, there's very little mm. that the, the British could do. But, but overall, 
I suppose two questions or two halves to the same question. Where does Britain now see itself standing in terms of, of global Britain, that ambition post-Brexit? And, you know, what, what is the sense, because you've been to the summits, mm. and you know, what is the sense from, from other countries about Britain standing now it's left the European Union? Well, I think there's an idealised vision that Boris Johnson has of global mm. Britain, but when it rubs up with reality, it's a rather different thing indeed. And... As Don was saying, in terms of Afghanistan, uh, it was a unilateral decision by the US. The UK was blindsided. The UK was scrambling. And the UK, in a way, looked diminished on the world stage. Indeed, it was Theresa May, the former Prime Minister, who said in the Commons after that directly to the Prime Minister, to Boris Johnson, if the US had taken a decision, is global Britain so powerless, if you like, that it can't come up with an alternative, that it can't galvanise NATO. And it was a question of, well, actually, what does global Britain stand for if you are just the puppy, if you like, of the US in that situation? So I think there's one thing around the bilateral relationship, and it being more important to the UK because of Brexit, the bilateral relationship with the US, but this being a US that is acting particularly unilaterally when it comes to decisions it's taken, because the reality is that on a global stage, Brexit has diminished the UK in that it's no longer part of the European gang. So that Biden might look to France or Germany to negotiate with that bloc rather than using that transatlantic bridge that was once the UK. And uh, Ashton, in terms of global issues, uh, the one that uh, has never gone away and isn't going away, but all eyes have been on, on other things over the last year, but terror, and we've seen terror attacks, or alleged terror attacks, taking place on UK soil this year. Yeah, I mean, the tragic killing of um, Sir David Amos MP um, down in South End on Sea um, was, I, I suppose, the, sh the shock of it, um, having sp been down... I, I mean, immediately I was sent down there and um, you sort of speak to people on the ground. And when growing up, I don't really know who my local MP was, to be perfectly honest with you, but this was somebody who everybody knew. Um, on the doorsteps, you'd be talking to people in the community. He was so well-loved. Yeah. Everyone could agree, from close friends to charities to neighbours, everyone agreed that... They might not have agreed with his politics, but this was a great man who not only cared about the national issues, but the local issues. Who cared about campaigning about the bus lanes? He, cam he campaigned about, um, you know, the, the high streets, in, in, in this, investing and invigorating local people to put South End on sea on the map. Um, but it was the brutality of his death that everybody... Um, that shook the whole community, and, and not only South End on sea, but the whole of the UK as well. OK. A Adam, I want to talk to you about uh, global issues. And Migration, of course, which we're going to discuss in another part of the podcast in more detail when it concerns the United Kingdom. But, of course, when it concerns uh, the European Union and the world, there's, there's a big crisis taking place in the European Union's eastern border. And it kind of relates as well to situations like Afghanistan, as we've been discussing. As long as those global debacles keep happening, there will be more migration. Yeah, this one is uh, this is on the, the effectively the border between Belarus uh, and, and largely Poland, and this one is is down to Alexander Lukashenko, the the leader of Belarus, elected in what I think we could safely describe as a a contested election, what we might uh, also describe as a completely fixed election. And what Mr. Lukashenko then did was to invite uh, would be refugees, largely from uh, sort of a Iraq, but also, from, you know, putting the net out around the world and saying, if you can get uh, to Minsk, then I will try to arrange for you to get to the border. And by the way, if you get across the border into Poland, you can get to Germany, which, let's not forget, Germany takes by far the number, uh, the greatest number of migrants in the EU, a lot more than uh, the UK, let's say, uh, takes. Uh, so people flooded into Minsk, got taken down to the border. Unsurprisingly, Poland decided that this was the last thing it wanted. Ditto Lithuania, ditto Latvia, and, and created this pretty horrific standoff uh, with humans being used as bargaining chips. And Mr Lukashenko knew this. He knew it would cause enormous arguments. He knew the EU would struggle to come up with a concerted response, which it did. In the end, I think it took a lot of pressure from the United States, and it also took... Some quite clever sanctions, for instance, on 
not just sanctioning Belarus that they've done that, but also threatening sanctions against airlines that were knowingly taking people uh, into Minsk. OK, well, uh, that's happening uh, on the eastern borders of the European Union. But uh, let's focus now on how migration is affecting the UK and relations between the UK and the EU. Cross-channel migrants normally operate in the shadows of night, but this is something profoundly different. Why did you risk her life to come across the channel? I'll let you to that. She said, because that was me for the life. I have already approved maritime tactics, including boat turnarounds for border force to deploy. 15 men overboard, approximately 15 men overboard. I think it's rather regrettable, isn't it, that the first thing we wake up to is another blame game. 27 people died on November the 24th, though we all remember that. Ashna, you've reported from the beaches, from off the beaches. Just, just tell us some of what you've seen, your impressions. I've seen so many of those touchdown moments, of those landings on the beaches. And I think lots of people think that they look like um, the people stepping off those boats are ecstatic, that they're celebratory. In reality, they're exhausted, they're shocked, they're fearful. Everything looks different. They spent months travelling in the most dangerous way. And then to finally arrive onto the cobbled beaches of Kent, I always wonder, is it what they expected? Everything looks different. The landscape's different. People aren't speaking the language they're used to. They've finally made it to Britain. Is this, is this what they wanted? And of course, they get shipped off to various houses, centres, across hotels across the UK. And so begins their refugee or asylum-seeking um, process. And that can take six months to two years. And the amount of money they get, I mean, it's pennies, really. It's about £30 a week. And suddenly they're having to adapt and integrate. And I do think a lot, and when I've spoken to a lot of them, um, in, in, you know, a few months after they've arrived, I spent a lot of time at, at the Napier Barracks in the surrounding area, which is a, a centre in Folkestone where a lot of the young men are, are, are housed. Um, and they're just... They're, they're almost a bit deflated because they're faced with a lot of animosity. Uh, from the communities there. But having said that, there's a huge charity you know, scope. I mean, the refugee crisis centres are, are quite remarkable in the work that they do. Um, but they, they're just... They're baffled, really, also, at the debate in all of this, because they, they sort of... There is a sense of frustration. They not see why we're coming over. Look at our countries, look at our nations. It's also not an ambition that they'll stay here. They just want to work here, earn money, and then go back, perhaps. It's definitely a divisive issue well, down in Kent. Th th that's really interesting to hear, because so, so now we have the opportunity to join up both ends of these long, long journeys, as you describe them there, Ashna, because, of course, we've got Alex here with us. Sue, Alex, of course, you've reported from so, so many of the countries where these journeys begin. And give us your sense of the, of the why, why people decide to leave the countries they're in. There are complex reasons, and also the role in facilitating that of the, of the people smugglers, so-called. Yeah, and I think it's interesting listening to Ashna because they definitely do it as a very, very last resort. No, no one I know of, and as you said, I've seen it from the other end, where people are desperately trying to get in touch with the people smugglers. I've spoken to the people smugglers. They, they're, they're very, very upset about leaving their homeland. They're crying. They, they, all they've got is a bag. Sometimes they don't even have that. They don't, all they have is the clothes they stand on. A lot of them don't even have documents with them to verify who they are. Um, it's astonishing to me that I went on that that journey from Turkey to Greece with a whole load of, uh, at that time, there were Syrians and Libyans, Iraqis, on one of those dinghies. And it was a terrifying experience. And that only lasted a couple of hours. They've already done a huge journey, you know, crossing over mountains and um, putting their faith and sometimes all their money, everything they've got in the hands of uh, a people smuggler. And those people smugglers can be a big range of them. You know, some of them, one of them, ones who was a young man that I was speaking to, was doing it because he felt it was a moral duty to help them. 
And then you've got the networks of the mafioso types who don't really care. They're numbers and they're just filling the boats and just sending them on the way. You give your money and whether you get over alive or not, you've lost that money. Well, let's go to those beaches of northern France. Adam's had plenty of experience of what goes on there and what doesn't go on. And by that, I mean, you know, the, the French efforts or not to try to, to stop some of those crossings, but also touch on the people smuggling operation there, the, the, the kind of people that are willing to put these desperate people, these desperate families into, you know, inflatable dinghies. So while every politician on either side of the channel says we have to clamp down on people smuggling, and you have this almost arms race between the British and the French about who hates people smugglers more. The reality is these people aren't, aren't going away. They are, by the way, making an absolute fortune out of this. But every time that I have spoken to migrants uh, in Calais or on the northern French coast, they're pretty much unembarrassed about saying they have to go to people smugglers. They don't think they have uh, any alternative. And so you do end up with, with, with these clusters of people suddenly appear on a beach. Now, normally it's happened at night. We had the extraordinary scene a, a couple of months ago when we were filming uh, on the northern French coast. We were on a beach talking to the French police who were there. And then about 100 metres away from us, dozens of people came running down, carrying an enormous boat, took it down uh, to, uh, to the shore, put it in the water, all with the French police watching, uh, and then spent ages trying to start this completely unsuitable engine in order to, to begin their voyage uh, across the channel. So in terms of what the French police do, well, in that case, they don't do anything. But this is, again, is a real source of tension because you've got again a big political row with the Brits saying well the French police should be doing a lot more uh, and, and we're giving them money and then the French interior minister Gerard Darmanin said to me well we haven't had any money and we have spent a lot more the reality is the French coast is very very long you'd need an armada frankly to seal that off night and day okay well uh, Dominic uh, Alex and Ashna you can all go. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Beth, Adam and I uh, next are going to discuss more about those rows over fish and sausages as we look at political posturing, let's call it that, in 2021. Now then, it's not, of course, just been the migrant crisis issue causing tension between the UK and its European neighbours. Not by a long chalk. One of the staff members has come out and said no more petrol. It's stupidity that we're all queuing up, but this is my job, so I've got to have diesel. And there's being 100,000 drivers short of what we need across the UK, but the shortages are, are being felt right through the food supply chain. Imagine if Bratwurst could not be moved from Dortmund to Dusseldorf. With no more than five hours sleep a night, she's maintained an unlikely grip on power. Lass ich meine Kraft dem Wohle des deutschen Volkes. Well, let's discuss all that with uh, Adam Parsons and Beth Rigby. And uh, Adam, we've talked, haven't we, on previous podcasts about um, the, the role of, of fish and the fishing industry uh, in this dispute between Britain and France. But, but just first of all, you know, explain for us the psychology from, from the French side about why it's so important. It's presumably as tiny a part of their economy as it is of the UK's. I think there's a few things at play here. I mean, you're right. It's a small part of the UK economy. It's a small part of the French economy. But in both cases, it has a symbolic importance that far outweighs any financial impact. So for the UK, I think this is about sovereignty. It's about controlling your waters. It's about making decisions about who can come in and who can't. Uh, for the French... Similar sort of things. It's also about here we have this historical precedent. Our, fr our, our fishermen have always gone out into these waters. Why should they be constrained now? Also, though, uh, Emmanuel Macron, he's got a presidential election coming up uh, uh, early next year. And he knows that that region of France last time round teetered between him and Marine Le Pen. Uh, and, and he doesn't want that to happen again. He wants to look strong. He wants to look like he is, he is a big leader who is not afraid of taking on uh, battles. And that, by the way, isn't just about Brexit. That is a part of Emmanuel Macron's great vision of himself. In the absence of Angela Merkel, she's kind of gone now. He sees himself as the next European leader. 
Well, uh, from fish, let's uh, go to sausages. Sounds like a <laughs> children's tea time, doesn't it? Fish fingers and sausages, uh, peas on the side, and you've got to eat those up. Um, Beth, why are sausages so important? And we're talking here about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah, the reason sausages are so important is about how freely goods can move between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and, and sausages and other uh, meat products have been the subject of some tension, should we say, between the European Union and the UK government about how the protocol is being implemented. I mean, is it going to get um, sorted? I mean, you know, the key question well, people want to know is, well, we thought this was done and dusted actually this time last year, just before Christmas. That's all sorted out now. Boris Johnson, two Christmases ago, had an election and said, you know, we've got an oven-ready deal, we've signed it off. Why are they still negotiating? Because the UK would argue that the protocol does not work and they need to look at it again, that it's not working and it's important for the sovereignty and the integrity of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. And the European Union would argue, well, hang on a minute, you signed the deal, you knew the terms of the deal, we will negotiate details of the implementation, but we are not ripping up this agreement and starting again, which is what the UK government would like to happen. So there is a stalemate at the moment. OK, Adam Parsons, Beth Rigby, brilliant talking to you both. And uh, just let me remind you that all of these special Sky News Daily podcasts with me, Dermot Murnahan, are available on demand wherever you get your podcasts or videos from. Now, our next podcast, we're going to be discussing climate change, the royals and space. <laughs> Quite a mixed bag. Uh, this edition was produced by Annie Joyce along with Felix Forbes. Thank you very much indeed for listening.